Welcome back to Mishpacha's Take Two, where the personalities and the people you read about in the pages of the magazine come to life. Over the last few months, we've had some pretty high-profile guests. We've had A-list from singers and leading Askanim and big speakers and big thinkers. I would venture to say that today's guest, in terms of impact, can rival or exceed any of them in terms of the reach and the significance of what he brings every day to the table. Rabbi Zlotowitz, Rabbi Gedali Zlotowitz, Shlita. Thank you for making time for this. I know this is very much not your... Not your for you, it's my style. I appreciate I'm it. I'm very happy to be here, especially in the seat that, as you say, giants sat in before. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. I appreciate it. I, I have to say that as somebody that I'm in touch with frequently, I speak to you often, I, I always learn new things about you. I think that there's a lot about you and about the way you do things that people maybe don't know. And if we could dive a little deeply into it, I think there's a lot of relevant lessons to be learned for everybody in their own lives businesses in their own world. Take me back. There was a Thursday, the end of June, end of Sivan, five years ago, and your father's in the hospital. It's a Thursday morning, and he's sending work emails from his phone, and he's going to come back to the office, and he's not feeling great, but he's expected to do well and be back at work soon, and people are coming and talking to him about work-related things Thursday. And by Matzah Shabbos, he's, he's no longer alive, and Sunday is the Levaya. And then there's Shiva. And while you're reeling from that shock, someone in the back of your mind, you know that the next Sunday or the next Monday morning, you're walking into an office and expected to assume control of what the phone world looks at as, as Apple or Microsoft or Amazon. It's, it's blue chip company. Tell me about that week. I remember Friday afternoon before my father was nifty. He was nifty on a Shabbos morning. He was, as you say, making phone calls, sending out emails. He was getting ready to come back. Figured another few days, he'll be out of rehab at that point, and he'll be coming back. Um, I was, Hatola came to my house Shabbos morning, and we went to my Manari's hospital. I went to my Manari's hospital, and he was nifted shortly thereafter. And I remember turning to my brother in law, Dovi Morgenstern, who was with me, and saying, Wow, my life is about to change. And it was just such a whirlwind. Mutter Shabbos, I remember calling of Dr. Feinstein, that's how, at that time, you know, he's the father of art schools, we'll get into later, and just breaking down, talking to him, and the shock of just getting the emails from people around the world. And I know everyone had the same feeling. Can art school go on? Is it even possible? My father was a giant. He was larger than life. And I always say, Jay Schattenstein gave me the best advice. Everyone was telling me, you have large shoes to fill, large shoes to fill. And he told me many times, I spoke to him at Shabbos and a few times during that week. And we speak every week since then. And he always told me, Gidal, you just remember, you don't have large shoes to fill. You have your shoes to fill. And if you do that, you're going to be successful. It's beautiful, and it, it definitely empowering to a young person. I can understand it. But at the same time, your father filled every crevice of this building. There was no party he wasn't involved in. He wasn't, uh, you know, I know you worked with him hand in hand for so many years, but he wasn't a big delegator. He did a lot of things himself. He had a lot of energy. So what was it like practically? So it's very interesting because a lot of people feel that my father was someone who was very controlling and had to have his ten fingers on everything and really be in charge of everything. But in retrospect, it obviously wasn't true. It means he wanted to be involved in the details, but he obviously empowered the people around him to become giants in their field. And the proof is that when the Rebbe Shalom took him away from us, art school didn't only continue, but it thrived. So looking back, he was a genius. He knew exactly what he was doing. He let everyone have the space they needed. He trained us. And he trained us to be the best at what we're going to be, whether it was myself or working with Rabbi Sherman, Rabbi Shia Brander, everyone in this building. So what would you tell? Well, let me ask like this. Mishpacha Magazine had a piece now in the Sukkot issue about success as people who assumed control of their father's businesses, usually after their father passed away, sometimes after retirement. And they said, what was some of the things that your father did that you do differently? That means your father was dealing with his times, his era, his challenges. And you, you must have your own mark. What would be something that you would say, your father was great, but what would you tell a young person in terms of making it yours? I would say that you have to think for yourself. It means you have to, I always tell people, say, how are you, 
why is art school being so successful now? And I say because I'm really standing on my father's shoulders. And if I think that way, it means he built a base. And I'm just building on the base that he right, put into place, on that foundation. So it's not like starting from scratch, like, okay, let's get rid of the foundation and let's start digging again. That would be impossible. Then you're starting a business from scratch. But if people would realize, and especially younger generation, they all come into their parents' businesses, and right away, I know better, my father doesn't know what he's doing, and why are they doing it this way? But as you mature and you watch the process, you see many times there's a reason. Someone who built a successful business did it, and they knew what they were doing. So instead of coming in and trying to destroy, right, I'm going to take it down, and I'm going to build myself, just stand on what they built and continue building. What other things do you do differently than him? I would say when it comes to Mr. Heritage Foundation, which we'll get into, my father was probably at a point where he had the people he was very close with, those dedicators he was close with, and that was his core people. And I don't think he really connected much with expanding to the younger generation. There were a few individuals that he did, and they were very close with him, but... In general, I find that, and I found that after this happened, people rallied around me. And I think that was part of my father's genius also. It wasn't just the relationship, like it's all about Meyer Lodowitz and these people, but he instilled in them this understanding that art scroll is going out and changing the world. And you're part of that. We're partners. It's not me and you. This is a partnership. And I feel that as in a bu- every business, when one partner pierces on and the other partners want the business to thrive, so what happens? They're going to rally around. They're going to say, okay, let's do it. And I really you feel that... They, they own that responsibility. They own the responsibility. It's incredible. And, and that was also part of his genius of making the people around him feel, right, friends, business associates... But how did, um, dedicators, that understanding that this is yours. It's not mine. And how did that work? I'll use an example. Rabbi Sherman spoke at the Shleishan for your father. It was a very moving speech. And he tearfully recalled making a coffee every morning and coming into your father's office. And they started the day. He said your father had already been there earlier. You know, he was... And he would come with the coffees. They would sit down. They would lose for a few minutes. Get in the same frame of mind about what they had to accomplish. And part ways. And he said, Gedalia, tomorrow morning I'm going to make a coffee for you. Now, I don't know on a practical level if he makes you a coffee <laughs> The coffee not, was there the next but, morning. Uh, how is someone <laughs> like that able to look at you, who's much younger than him, next generation, and be able to continue to do what they were doing when working in tandem with somebody from another? You know, that's a great question, but you have to ask Rabbi Sherman. The truth is that, that his, he's so humble. He's a giant. Rabbi Sherman is a goddle in our time. He's a giant. But for him to really humble himself to me which made me feel very uncomfortable, is all part of the success. Again, nothing at Art School is about any individual. We just finished an editorial meeting earlier today with the top, top people who are running our projects, or Bailey Hertzka and Zevi Meisels and the Danzig Brothers, oh, giants, giants. And we're really looking for more people to join the staff and writers, editors. And you no, know, we had someone come in, maybe it would help us look for people, and they said, what is the number one thing you're looking for? And every single editor and writer and, you know, member of the coil in the room said, someone who understands that we're working as a team. If it's someone who just thinks that it's about them, they're not going to be happy here. That's a problem, because that's called sort of a mindset. It's really sort of a yeshiva. It's certainly a coil, like you said. You have yourself, and you have a Nassim Zayagazant, and a Shia brand, as well as Zayagazant. Each one of them is legendary. And you don't seem to have any politics. It's not a real mice then. It's, uh, what's a mice without <laughs> somebody? Just, it's amazing. I, I wish on every organization okay, that they should have the show that uh, we have. It's unbelievable. And it's, it, because no one looks at it that it's about them. I have to ask you a question. Uh, forgive it. What is Oscar? I never, I never got this clear. Is it an organization? Is it a nonprofit? Is it a business? I, I don't understand the structure of Okay, so let, I'll of, explain to you the structure. How Oscar works. We have a business called Masara Publications. We're publishers. means if Sruli Bessa decides to write a storybook, or Ibichel Spira, or Pesach Kron, or someone writes a novel, a cookbook, a children's book, like you go to any publisher, you have a finished manuscript, 
and you go over to the publisher and say, here's my manuscript, and the general process of publishing is the publisher takes a manuscript, edits it, proofreads it, does pa- pagination, printing, binding, sales, everything involved from the time the manuscript is written until it goes out to the public. Mm-hmm. And then how does the author make money? The author makes money by a royalty. So for every book that sells, an ro- author gets a royalty. That's the business model. And that's a business. That's a business. Clear business, and we don't take any public funding for that part of the business because it's profitable. However, there's parts of what we do is that my father had this dream of taking Torah works and opening it up to the public, which is a very expensive proposition. We have a koilu, which we call a koilu without walls because it's not in one place. But we have a koilu of over 100 Yungalite that are working on various projects. Is it 100 people working on art school Torah projects now? On Torah projects, yeah. Wow. Okay. And for, just to take an example, a, 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 the Shas cost over $25 million to produce, 73 volumes over 15 years, which anyone on a business level would say, we can't invest that kind of money, it's impossible. So the same way people are supporting Kailim, who are putting out countries, or go to the secular world. There are colleges that have their own press, and you could have some professor who wants to write a book on butterflies. How butterflies fly? How do they publish that? Obviously, it's not a profitable thing. They have finds one person who loves butterflies and says, you know what? I want the world to know about butterflies. So I'm going to pay for the manuscript to be written about butterflies. Okay. Now it's written. They take that manuscript and they go to a publisher to publish the book. So we're doing the same thing. So the Msori Heritage Foundation, which has an oversight of the top minds in the country watching everything we do, is taking, is really giving people the schus and asking people to say, listen, you want or Chaim HaKadosh on Chumash, Rashi on Chumash. So you're not making a question of, of a, if it will sell or make money. when you're We're not up to, to sales. Now we're producing a manuscript. So we take top Tamid HaChamim, scholars in the country, and they're learning, and they're writing, and they're preparing the manuscript. That is the only thing that Masori Heritage Foundation is paying for. Now there's a manuscript. They need a publisher to publish it. So they go from the non-for-profit that paid for the manuscript to the publisher. So now the publisher, which is Masori Publications, takes the manuscript and publishes it. There's a lot of costs involved, whether it's the final proofreading, pagination, cover design, advertising, and they go out and sell the book. Many books sell, many books don't. How many people are buying Daniel and Tanakh? So there are some books that your father did and that you're doing that you knew were never going to make recoup what you invested? Most of them. Did any of them surprise you? And you said, wow, that, that actually ended well, up selling? Well, I mean, something like the Stone Chumash obviously was you know, and that, a big success. And that money success. goes back into the foundation, though. The, some the of profits. it goes back into the foundation. From, from but again, we have an agreement, the Missouri Heritage Foundation with Missouri Publications, that Missouri Publications is not allowed to make more than a certain profit on those books, if any profit at all. And they're watching it. If there's any profit above a certain level, the money has to and go back to the foundation. That gets out of the twice a year. Okay. I think, I think. But, but that's, that's the only way to produce these books. And then what happens is, we do take, you worry that people are like me, are confused about I that? I think many people are. They don't you know. understand. Like, art scroll, what do they need my money for? I, I, uh, I didn't want to ask it like that. No, That's but you, I say straight question. out. I know. But that was the question I was asking. Like, is it a business or is it a foundation? Or but what we do is also, you have to realize, we take, a, let's say take a novel. Okay, a regular novel was selling for $27 list price. Okay. Okay. store is paying us about $16. You take a volume of Arachayim. Arachayim, let's do a volume like that, which is the same number of pages as a novel. It has a gorgeous embossed cover, gold stamped, and you know the amount of work and the, the, the cost that goes into it, because you're going to print less than you are of a storybook, more storybooks are selling, that also raises the cost. We're selling it for the same $31. I got it. So it's being subsidized. So not only is the dedicator making the work available and opening up Tayyar to Klal Yisrael, by having the Koyla work on the manuscripts, they're subsidizing the price to the public. It's like we always say, a Gemara based on, if this would be a business model, a volume of a Gemara should cost $150. Right. 
It doesn't. Now, what, being what do you do every day? You come to the office, so you're just fundraising all day? What, do you, what, what is your role? My role is to deal with publications, authors, to make sure... How, I've spoken to you in books I've written. You're, you're busy with the captions under the pictures. You seem to be busy with the details of the books, too. Depends on the book. So most books we don't get involved with. You, I do sit and we work on captions, and we had a great time doing the Rabbi Trank book, etc., but it's more of a um, overall level. In other words, what are we publishing? Can I ask you what your budget is? Our budget, I'm sorry, Heritage Foundation, yeah. eight and a half million dollars. So year. you're raising eight and a half million dollars a year. You don't have a fundraising team. You don't have a development team. You don't. But we have a lot of good friends who understand the need. I mean, can I ask you a question? How many art scroll books, Siddur, Chumash, Tehillim, Svarim, are you using a day on average? Or not it's you, so, the oh, average yeah, it's person. It's certainly true. It's more than that. I, At I, least I, I two or three. Thing. I was looking around Shul on, over the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur season, starting from Aleph to Slichas, going to, going to Matzei Shemini Atzeres, uh, And you say, where, where, where would we be? Where would my kids be? If they, 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 would, they would have no access to any of this. So it's certainly true that art school, a lot of people say they changed the world. It's, it's maybe even a buzzword to say we're changing the world. Art school changing the world every day is no question. But that's still a lot of money for you to have to raise. The people in this Kylo that you talked about are getting checks every month? Every, every week. Every week you send that check to all those people? They're working. And they're the sitting in, in Beitar or in Lakewood or in all Yeshiva Lane. And, and if somebody wants to join that, they could. How would somebody. Uh, we, <laughs> I'm, I'm just would, thinking there must be people. We would love to welcome so more jobs. people if, if people could write and they could. If someone knows how to learn and they just learn, want to articulate and make a difference. Themselves be able to break down the you concepts. You would take new projects for new writers if people can sure. And we could go quicker. We're working now on Ein Yaakov, Taisvis, Zara Shimshin, um, with Hebrew projects that they say for Achinach. We're working on um, would you let anybody Yushalmi. Think? Yushalmi. It's endless. Is so, Yushalmi so is a big projects. strain on your father. What? Father, Yushalmi is a tremendous strain on your father now. Yeah. They said it will not be done. 51 volumes. They said later. there was no chance. He wouldn't find sponsors. He wouldn't find mm-hmm. writers. He was discouraged. You know, to, to Mr. Jay Schottenstein and to Jay and Jeannie's credit and their family, um, he had always stepped up. He doesn't cover the whole budget, but he's always the anchor to make these large projects possible. And everyone knows that Jay Schottenstein is a very smart businessman. He wouldn't be dedicating volumes if he didn't see right the, the need and the... What he has accomplished in his life is just incredible. And everyone's using it. Everyone. We are probably the only organization that's accepted in all areas of Yiddishkeit. Think about it. All Who doesn't use Art Scroll? Who doesn't use our Art Scroll? Art Scroll products. Anywhere. Any type of community. Whether it's the Hebrew Mishnayis, the Rise of Mishnayis, the Shatanstein Gemar in Hebrew, or our Siddur and Chumash. Would you let anybody be a dedicator if somebody came in with their checkbook? Or are you discriminating in who you take money from? I wouldn't say discriminating, but my father taught me that we have to be careful who we take money have from. Have you turned away people? We have. Can we talk about yourself now a little bit? A little, a little less about Oscar, a little bit about you? If you want. I want to share a fun <laughs> fact with our viewers about you. That they may not know you. are a very hardworking person. I, you know, just this summer you told me that because Fridays in the summer... The staff gets off. A lot of people go upstate. So you you extend the work day by an hour every day of the week not to lose. There's a serious work ethic going on over here, and you feel it any time you come in. And yet, and yet, the same Rabbi Gedalia Zlotowitz, <laughs> who literally moves from call to call to call and, and, and is always working, takes three days off a year. That's going kind of with his family, no. But to go to Camp Monk and oversee Kalua. Now, you're in Camp Monk in the summers. Anyhow, your wife is the camp mother. You go out for Shabbos. But Kalua, three work days... This play shuts down. I shouldn't say the play shuts down, but you're not here. The boss isn't here. What's up with that? Explain yes. to me what motivates <clears throat> you to do that, what the decision-making is to go referee hockey so games. You're a camp monk boy. So you are, let's Indeed. talk about camp in general. I think we've spoken about this many times, that camp saves lives on a spiritual level and on an emotional level. You know, yeshiva is the most important thing kids have to go to school, they have to go to yeshiva, but as we know, they don't have the outlets in yeshiva that they have during the summer, and not everyone can make it in yeshiva. So they try, and we have wonderful rebellion, they work with them, but those same rebellion, you ask every one of them who works in a camp, 
and you have a child in camp now, a camper in camp, a staff member, and I can think of so many of them that thrived doing a piece of art in Kaloa, or they were good in sports, or they were good at singing, or they were good at acting. And it gave them the self-confidence then to go back to yeshiva and to thrive after such a summer. I always say, maybe someone who didn't go to camp can't understand it. But in general, you look at color as a microcosm of life. It's a chinuch opportunity. You have a general, you have captains, you have the people under the captains. Everyone has a job. And you have to get along with people. I don't like your idea for a banner. Well, too bad. I'm the general. Well, how do you speak to the guy under you? Do you force it down his throat? Or do you talk it down? You learn to be political about it. What happens when a kid messes up? And what do, what do you, why do you have to be there? What is your role? I don't have your... to be there. Believe me, color will run without me. I feel if there's one part, I don't regret anything in my life, Baruch Hashem. I love what I do. And you know, I, I love what I do. But going into Chinuch and having the opportunity to be Mechanich younger people would have been a dream of mine to do. I would love I it. I heard this from your father many times. Gedal, you wanted to be a Rebbe, you wanted to be a Rav. Right. And Baruch Hashem, what I'm doing, I wouldn't trade with anyone. We're changing the world. We're helping hundreds of thousands of people. But the opportunity of being camp, and after we were married, we got married, we were there for six years, married our assistant at counselor, and then when my wife got the job as the camp mother in camp 16 years ago, we grabbed the opportunity, I'm there weekends, I interact with the counselors, with the campers, with the staff, and maybe that's just getting it out of my system, that idea of this is a great time of the chinuch, to sit at a fabreng on a Friday night, speak to the teenagers, hear their challenges. Maybe subconsciously it helps at art school also to hear what the, today's teenagers need, what today's counselors need, the kids need. To be in touch with what's on their hearts and minds. It's, it's something that's Does so it special. Does it bother you that camp in general has become, I wouldn't say less cool, but a lot of the Bachan over the last few years talked a lot about this in the magazine. We've talked about this personally. <clears throat> They'd rather go, some of them want to go on road trips, some of them don't want to go to camp at all. Sometimes the yeshiva schedule, which, you know, when you were a counselor, allowed for the Bachum to go to camp. The Shivas don't want them to go to camp. And Mrs. Zman, you must so have I think thoughts you, on that. You brought up two separate points. On the first point, I feel it's part of today's lack of a karsa type in today's generation. A kid went to camp, and he had counselors who invested so much into him. And he was there from 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All of a sudden, he turns 19, and the next generation needs him and that's what I'm off on my road trip. Or where's your chryas? You think that they know that though about themselves? You're saying it's a No, I don't they think they probably know that. don't even know themselves that they can make a difference. Okay, so, but they should, someone should point it out to them. I think they do know. I think they're aware of it, and they just say, "I have to worry about myself. I need my time. I need my road trip." But they're cheating themselves. Forget it about you. forget about that, that, that they're not giving back. They're cheating themselves. Do you know how much a bacha would gain from being in a bunk? and being able to articulate and speak to a younger camper and give over what he learned, give over the chinuch he has. Why are you not doing that? What are you gaining from the road trip? Seeing another mountain? and That's really, that's what, that's what you're gaining? Wow. Uh, okay. I, this I haven't heard from you. Like this, this that's, no one, that, that's one that's But you're part. dreaming because they're not, they're not going to get that message. It's not, it's not they're not going to... There has to be a better plan than telling the Bachum that it's a chinuch opportunity. We have to figure out something out. We have to figure out the. I think this year was almost a crisis to get quality counselors. It's very hard. It is right. The second part is what you said: the yeshivas aren't working with the camps. Now that's above anything I should be commenting on, but I really don't understand it. You have a rabbi. You know, tell us a little bit about your relationship with your rabbi. So I got my smicha from Rav Pam Zatzal. It's a malach elikim. Um, I learned in Riverdale under Rav Azband. Baruch Hashem, I have the schus for the last 25 years to go back every Sunday morning to learn with him, with the Chabura. And there's nothing more important in life than having a Rebbe. And he keeps me in line. You, everyone needs someone in life that could look at you at any point and say, what you're doing is wrong. Maybe you should be thinking different about something. Does he do that for you often? He sure does. And you speak to him, family things, chinuch things, he's a uh, presence in your life? He, if I have to, I do. I generally, I don't get too involved, you know, on detail levels in my life, but 
he knows exactly what's going on, and he was very supportive after my father was nifter. He gave me great advice. But just knowing that you have a Rebbe who loves you, who cares, who is looking out for you, and will not just be a yes man and say, yeah, everything's great, you look great, you look great. But if you're doing something wrong, I mean, you have it in your life. Right? You have your Rebbe, and you know what that means in your life. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that. They leave yeshiva without a Rebbe. And they're drifting. Wow. And they're not doing anything wrong because they don't know better. But if someone would, without any geese would just tell them, whoa, stop, just think. I felt very bad. We did a book. I, I think I could say we did the book together. We co-authored a book on Uvdava Trank. It says my name on the cover, but we really, you know that your heart and soul is on every page of that book. And people told me afterwards, Nifta, why, why don't we know about these people when they're alive? And I feel bad because there are people out there who are alive, who are very good at it, and very dedicated and very caring and very qualified for it. I don't know if there's a mechanism to let people know or how we could, like you're saying, everybody should have a Rebbe. We need to find a way to make yeah. Shadduchim between the Rebbeim and the Talmud. Rebbeim are saving like they're, so, they're fantastic Rebbeim. My, my children, my sons have had the greatest Rebbeim. Who, the other night, I was at a chasna last night and I went over to my son's fifth grade Rebbe and I said, you saved my son's life. You believed in him. He was... He, he, he was you just believed in him, and he still loves him till this day. I said, he's much older now. I said, you turned his life around in fifth grade. And there are so many Rebbeim like that. We are so blessed in Klal Yisrael. So you're a big believer in the Chinuch system, and at, but at the same time, you want to rethink camp and the relationship between the Shivas and camps. Only because I think the kids are, are going, many times they're, what they gained over the 10 months with the great Rebbe, they might be going down a few steps in the summer. That's why that bothers so, me. That's a point to consider. Art school, the rabbi of art school, was, was Moen Reb David Feinstein. He, he carried art school. For, think that the, I asked him this when I wrote the book on your father, if it's true, and he didn't want me to write it, but that he had lent his savings, $25,000, I think right. to your father at a difficult time. What have the last, what's the last year almost been like for you without the presence of somebody who relied on so heavily? Well, just going back, once you bring that up, I mean, the success of Art Scroll, I believe, is that every move my father and Rabbi Sherman and Rabbi Brandon made was with Das Torah. They had the Rebbeim, whether it was Rav David, Rav Gifta, you know, um, any, all of them, every single one of them. Rav Yankif, when they started from day one. But at the end of the day, Rav David was the one my father was closest to. Everyone knows they spoke to each other practically every day. And the hadrocha came from him. Whatever he said, we did. And we know there were projects that my father started, and Rav David heard about it, and he said, no, my father was invested in it emotionally. He dropped it right away. So we have 45 well, years of advice. Sorry, credit your father. They said Rav David Feinstein was a nister when his father was nister. People didn't realize what he was capable of, what he knew, because he wasn't a social person. He didn't run around shaking hands. They said, Mayor Zlatowicz gets the credit. To making people David Feinstein. Okay, maybe. We'll maybe. leave that for other people. Okay. My father loved him and we didn't make a move without him. And for, we have 45 years of Hadracha. We were Zaycha, 45 years of Hadracha from David on every step of the way. Did and he, tell he you never things? let, and every time I went to him and asked him something, whatever he said, you felt it was Ruach It's Like there was no doubt. You listen and you're going to be successful. And there were many things over the last few years before he was Nifter that I did discuss with him and ask him about various projects we were dreaming of, and he gave us the hadracha. It's very hard now without him. And, but frankly, you know, Baruch Hashem, we have Reb Nassim here, who is a gadol in his own right, who learned under Reb Yankiv Zatzal, learned under Reb Gedal Yeshur, and had his own rebbeim, and heard all the hadracha over the years when I was still a young boy, and hearing it straight from Rav Gifta and Rav Yankif and Rav David and Rav Meisha and whoever it was. So we have who to ask. There's people to go to. I want to ask you another question. It's, it's a thing we've, we've discussed off camera many times. There's a knock on art school biographies. Some of them written by me and other ones written by my very talented and gifted colleagues who do the same thing. That art school books, I don't even know how you pronounce the word. It's hagiography or hagiography but that they cleanse and they, they rewrite history and they only put in the good things about the subjects of the books and they leave out anything, anything sordid or anything embarrassing, so they're not real biographies. The ac- academic world likes to mock art school biographies. You're aware of that. So my, yes, I am. So my father's view always was that an art school biography or any art school book 
is meant to inspire, not necessarily to tell the whole story. We would never tell an untruth. When you say rewrite, it's not really the correct word, because rewrite makes it sound like this happened, but we're rewriting it a different way. Leaving out a part of history that would not inspire someone, what's the point? Who are you? So Why? you write about a certain God, and there was a machlekis. Because I have something. to know that. Because Why do you have to know that? Because maybe he made that decision for reasons that and are you're relevant to know the Shkafa. decision. Srili Bess is going to read that book 50 years later and understand what went through that Godel's mind. But who are you to be the arbiter of what belongs and what doesn't? Maybe, maybe yeah. We're the arbiter, know what inspires and what doesn't. And reading about a machlekis doesn't inspire anyone. It doesn't inspire. So what's the point? We're here to inspire so you're, you're Jews to be better you know, It doesn't bother you when you, when you read all. those charges or you read no. those knocks on. It would bother me if we were writing something that wasn't true. But everything we're writing is true. We're just leaving out the parts that are just not inspiring. And we're not knocking in but any way the Godel. We don't understand. Today's generation might not understand why they did something. Okay, but what about the fact that people think, okay, they're not, it's not relevant to the Godel, because these people never made mistakes. They never slipped off. They never slept in a mischachos. They never had a bad day. They never flicked the light switch on showers by mistake. Then You're they're right. not Negemi. And that's why some of a book like... You know, some of the books that we discussed that are not about the God who was born a genius, but the one who was born in America and went to public school and made it, sometimes talks to someone a lot more than the God who was born a genius. But again, the, we're not talking about not writing that someone turned on a light. We're talking about, and that's what they refer to, when there's a machlekes, when there are wars between factions. What's the point? I hear, I hear, uh, but you, you, it's on a case-by-case. We want case. to inspire, that's the bottom line. We're here to inspire Jews to be better Jews. Will it inspire you to read about it? We're going to publish it. Uh, if we're not going to inspire you, we're not publishing detail. it. I hope you'll be Michael me. We did the book on your father together. Your parents got divorced when you were a little child, and it was, uh, it was a question if it should go in the book or not, and you and your whole family, really, uh, gets the credit for saying right away, of course, there was, is the, first of all, there's a lot to learn from how it was handled. And it's a very much a relevant part in how he drew on his rabbi for support and, and the graciousness or the, or I would say the, the tolerance with which it was handled in the years, the, the relationship between the two families. What, what, was, what was that like for you, being, being a child of divorce? Well, just it's, before we get to the divorce be? a second, there's the entire book, we made a decision when we sat down and we said, are we going to be honest? Are we going to paint my father as this born prodigy who was a genius and the superstar of the class and we decided no we're going to inspire people you know we're going to inspire them by saying that Meyer Zlatowicz stuttered as a child was not good in sports but he excelled in what he was good at and he overcame his stuttering and he became the person he was and that inspires people and that's the same thing with the divorce how many people would go through a divorce any divorce, and say, I can't be a leader now. You know, it's like embarrassing, especially those days. But no, he right. overcame it. There no support and how did he overcome it? Because he loved his children, and he said, I am not going to let anything get in the way of that love. The joke, as you know, we speak about it many times. Someone once said, my father had a better divorce than many people have marriages. But it was done consciously that I'm not going to hurt my children. We don't know the hurt he was going through in his own personal life, but he made a decision. I am not making my children carbonos. I'm not sacrificing them. And he saved us. And that's what people should learn from. That, that, what would be your personal message as, as a child to grow up? It's not, not an easy thing. With all the fact that they made sure to be peaceful with each other and respectful of one another. And I believe you told me that he made you call your maternal grandparents to say good Shabbos. Yes. It's astounding when you hear how people just want to stick the knife in deeper today. But with all that, what would be your message to children today whose, whose parents aren't together anymore and they feel like they're, they're broken in two? The message to the children what or the message would you to the parents? Say? It's your show. You tell me. I mean, the message to a child whose parents are... I, I look at you as a successful person, Baruch Hashem, who's, who's doing great things, and people look at you as... But I can't answer. And, I can't be in You've the, been there. No, I haven't, because my... No, my, your message to children. They got along. Right, but would, I'm saying I, the message okay. would be to parents is don't use your children as pawns. And message to children no matter what, whose family no structure is not the way they would wish it to be. What would you tell them? My parents loved me, 
And I heard from my father every day of my life how much he loved me and my mother. So, but how, what am I telling a child that might not hear that from a parent? I can only tell the parent, tell your child you love them and don't use them as pawns and they'll be successful. The divorce won't affect them at all. We heard a lot of nice feedback to the book from people in similar situations, some divorce and some for other reasons alone, that they, they couldn't believe the mayor's daughter was 33 years old, living in a walk-up apartment in Borough Park with three kids, and, and thinking that there'll be no tomorrow, and look what he went and did with that. That's amazing. So let's bring it back. So I'm using that, I was using the divorce as an example, and I got sidetracked. So you're comfortable with the art school position on how you do books and what you choose to share, and what you choose not to Very. share. What about in the world of halacha? Are there, are there standards that you have of uh, what kind of books you would take, what kind of books you wouldn't take in, in more Torah-oriented so projects? our rule in halacha is we, you know, they used to make a joke about Mr. Trainer that he would make a daylum because whoever he took pictures of became the next gadol. We don't want to make, art school is not here to make paiskim. We're here to publish quality works from paiskim. And therefore, when we have someone like Simcha Badam Kohn Shlita, Ben Yaman Four Shlita, so we're, we're very happy to publish those halachas for them, and they're very needed. But we're always getting in, like, you know, people are calling us up, I'd like you to publish this halacha safe, and it's a little contrast, or even a big contrast on a specific title. But are they accepted? Because they want Cloud the instant respectability, respectability that comes with the art school brand. They so, realize that you're right. a ma- Oh, yeah. So we would generally ask them to have a renowned posek to Somebody who's already an existing... Exactly. It was accepted by Kali Yisrael. We don't want to be the ones to create the poskim. What book, project, or that you're involved in, or you've been involved in, or you're most proud of? Which is the one that when you fall asleep and you say, before Neil and Yom Kippur, you say, thank you for this, Chas? That I started, you mean? That I... Yeah. Well, something that you've done a lot for. I think all the new projects were starting. There's so much, but really at this point, it's a Tysus project. I Is think it? it's the hardest project we ever took on. It's a, you know, what the Gemara did in the 1990s for Dafyomi learning and getting people, Balabatim, to start learning Gemara because it didn't look like this before the Schattenstein Talmud. And, it, you know, Klai is grateful to the Schattensteins and to all the dedicators who made it possible Klal Yisrael's once more. They're thirsting for more learning and a higher level of learning. And they're not satisfied with just sitting down at a Gemara and in 35, 40 minutes just reading through the blat. And it's important to do that, but they want more. That's the thing we hear from everybody. I want to raise my level of you, learning. You and Taisus is doing that. COVID really pushed our school to the next level and you responded. That means people are home. And they reached us for them all of a sudden, and they fell in love with learning. People during COVID found out that we had published things over the years they never knew about because they had time. They weren't traveling as much. They weren't running to Simchas. They had time on their hands, and they wanted to learn. So the, mice, the bottom line is that a, the that soul of a Yid wants to learn Torah. At the end of the day, when all said and done, and they found projects that we worked on over the years, and they were like, wow, this is great. So whether it was Kitz or Shulchan or all the Mepharshim or Chumish or, or Medrish, it was like, wow, I, you know, Mishnayis, I could just keep on learning more and more and more, and that's what's happening. They're seeing that we are there for them and their children and their families. It's amazing. A final question for you, Rabbi Zlatowitz. Mashiach's going to come, because your father comes back into the office. You're giving him the keys and you're telling him, here, it's back to you. Are you proud of the job you've done? Do you feel like you would be proud of what you've done here? Without sounding haughty, I think he'd be very proud. But not because of what I did. He'll be more proud of all the people in the Art School family, which includes the employees, the dedicators, and all his friends who rallied around me and made what I did possible. Because without them, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. 